Early is fine. <laughs> All right, over to okay, the we ready to go? Yeah. Uh, please welcome Dinesh. Hi. To the guys, people at the back want to grab seats? No, okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you to Pi Data for uh, inviting me here. It's good to see a nice big crowd. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, popping your filter or pop your filter bubble. Uh, a little bit about me first. I have, over my career, primarily a systems background. Okay? So that means that whenever I look at something, I look at it from an end-to-end -end perspective. Okay? And that kind of has helped me with machine learning, and it hasn't. Okay? Because primarily, machine learning is not an end-to-end -end system. Okay? And I know that for a fact that nowadays people are kind of are struggling with that whole idea of actually incorporating machine learning systems well, machine learning into enterprise systems, okay? And it's not an easy task. So I've been at it for 10 years plus, primarily with uh, Zubin uh, Garamani, which I assume most people know who he is, yes? How many don't? Okay, you can look him up. He's one of, he's one of the top uh, machine, machine learning guys in the world, focused primarily on uh, Bayesian, okay? And my street cred is that I've been using Python, NumPy, and SciPy since 2007 in anger. I've seen a lot, done a lot. Uh, one of the highlights that I, well, one of the highlights for me was to actually put uh, Thingy, which is the uh, product I'm going to talk about, uh, across a uh, HPC cluster of 1,024 CPUs. This was at, uh, at the Cambridge one. In fact, it was the old one. Uh, they've, got up, they've updated it since. And if I have time, I think I've only got 25 minutes, OK? And at first, when they told me I was on, I thought I haven't got enough material for 25 minutes. And now I've got more than enough material for 25. So I have to have a cutoff. But the slides will be available. And I've got results for the, some tests that I did on the HPC, OK? If I don't get to it in the presentation. And just to brag a little, I've got a Stack Overflow reputation somewhere high. Okay. So we're going to talk about the bubble first. And this is really uh, kind of a few wordy slides, but kind of hang in there. I'm not going to hang around too long talking about it, but it's important that I do because it provides context. And I'm sure it's a reason why a lot of you are here. Uh, then we'll talk about the uh, concept of the filter, which is you know, recommendation engines, and uh, what makes Thingy different. And then POP, which is really looking at Thingy itself. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to show you example results okay, of what makes it different. All right. And these are real uh, examples. OK? So, bubble. So I don't think there's any doubt right, that the uh, 2016 Brexit referendum and the US election were a turning point. Okay? And if you read the, uh, the media, you know, you know, it doesn't matter which side of the argument you're on, it was still a turning point. We know that bad stuff happened. Right? And it continues to happen globally. Right? Uh, and more and more, social media and recommendation engines are being implicated. Right? And certainly in the US, the worm has turned. The worm meaning uh, technology journalists, right? who've always been, to be honest, in the pockets of technology companies. Okay? They will always do the they will always follow what the technology vendors are doing. They'll report them in, good, uh, in a good way. But what we've seen in the last few months is that it's slowly turning around. They turn, these uh, journalists are actually turning on the vendors themselves. Uh, and I'm going to quote Kara Swisher, who 
is probably one of the uh, most influential journalists in technology in the United States and has recently started writing for the New York Times. And let me just go here. So just uh, two weeks ago, she wrote that, and I'll just quote what she said, that Facebook have weaponized social media and we are all paying the price. I don't think anyone's going to disagree with that. And that Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube have become the digital arms dealers of the modern age. They have mutated from con connecting people to pitting them against one another and turbocharged the discord to an unprecedented and damaging volume. But the bit that I want to emphasize is the last one. There's no solution in sight because they were built to work exactly this way. Okay? And in fact, if you, I recommend that you find this and have a read of it. And actually, she says, they really don't have a solution to this. Okay? They built a technology, and it works in a certain way, and it's gone to an extreme level. And for them to try and they can scale some of it back, but it's still going to work in the same way. Francois Chalot, Chalet, I don't know how to say that, right, is the uh, author or inventor of Keras, which is part of TensorFlow now. Okay? And he also wrote this wonderful uh, essay in March, which I would also recommend that you go and have a, a read of. And he said, is superintelligence the real danger, which is what most people are panicking about nowadays, right? Or the scalable manipulation of human behavioral behavior AI enables and its malicious use. And it's also entered into popular culture. Okay. How many people have seen Incredibles 2? No, spoilers. <laughs> no th th I'm not giving any spoilers. How many? Is that it? Okay, so, you've got, so you haven't got kids. <laughs> All right. Okay. The villain is called Screen Slayer. Okay, and you can see him on the top there with the... Uh, uh, bright eyes, okay? And the screen slayer basically takes over people's mind and agency. Does it remind you of anyone? Yeah. Now, the interesting thing is, right, actually, uh, Incredibles 2 is the highest grossing, uh, highest grossing animation movie in the US so far, and probably will be worldwide, okay? So that's another reason to go and see it. The interesting thing is, right, if you look at villains, right, in superhero movies or animation movies, right? You know, it's the mole or, you know, uh, what was the one in uh, Incredibles uh, 1? Uh, I forget his name. What was that? Syndrome? Syndrome, yeah. Syndrome, you know. Okay? And, you know, they, they were just kind of characters you knew were not real, yeah? But yet this is the first time you've got a villain that you know about, okay? Because you use it every day. Okay, let's move on to the filter. So recommendations engines have spread like a virus because of open source. Now, that might sound controversial, but it's not, okay? Uh, you know, I've been using open source software for a long time, open source libraries, right? And if I want to do something, I'd go and look on GitHub, try and find a library or uh, PyPy. And most likely, all I'll do, right, is just stick data into it. I won't mess around with the actual core algorithm, and off I go. And I think that's how most people use libraries, don't they? Right? You don't actually go digging around in the core algorithm to try and change it. You just want something that will work. You look at the easiest way to do that. Okay? And, and it's because of that ease of use, right, that recommendation engines have just literally just spread. Right? Everyone uses them, and they all use the same one, and recommendation engines all behave the same. Okay? Where each customer or consumer is put into a single lane, okay? without any control. Okay? Really important. The consumer has no control. If you look at whether it's a Facebook news feed, or you know, other ones, even Netflix, right? it just gives it to you, and you can't do anything about it. Right? So it's a closed road, right? 
It's not like the open road where you are given control of the car. Okay, so that was about control. Now, this is other quotes from a very popular uh, newsletter called Inside AI. And the guy, Rob May, uh, who's the author of the newsletter and also uh, the CEO of an uh, AI company and an investor in AI companies, he says, this was just uh, a couple of weeks ago, if companies don't start embracing AI, they're going to le be left behind. Why? AI requires multiple areas of change. AI requires training of the software more than training of the user. Okay, well, we know about that. This is a new concept that requires a new work, a new, that requires new workflows which users aren't accustomed to. No. And then he says, every AI software CEO I know complains software buyers treat this like a normal software sale. It isn't. It's much more existential than that. Right. And... I've actually, I said that I work for, in, I have a systems background, but I've actually worked for US software companies too, involved with systems, right? And I know this is just hogwash, okay? Because it's just self-serving. You know, you've got AI uh, software CEOs saying to companies, to enterprises, to organizations, sorry, if you want AI, you're gonna have to change your uh, <coughs> enterprise uh, workflows, the ones that you, spend decades building in order to support AI, which is static. Yeah? On one hand, you've got dynamic workflows, and then you've got the AI uh, CEOs and the salespeople saying, yeah, here's AI, it's static, now you change your workflows to fit around this. I laugh. Okay, and that's my message, you know. Enterprises and organizations have to be really careful, okay? And you've got to understand that this difference between dynamic and AI, which is primarily static systems. If we go back uh, in the past of uh, computing, let's look at two examples of uh, dynamic or real-time algorithms. The B tree and B plus tree is now in every single database management system in the world. Doesn't matter who brings one out, who's got one, there's a B tree uh, uh, data structure behind it. Okay? It was invented at Boeing in the 70s for document management, and you can understand why Boeing wanted to do that. Right? You know, you've got this huge, massive plane, and you've got a ton of documents. All right? They needed a way to actually store all those documents. Okay? And that's where the genesis of B trees started. And around the 80s and 90s, Oracle introduced real-time transactions. Okay? And if you think about real-time transactions, okay, without it, the internet today or e-commerce would just not work. Because, you know, someone buys something, okay, that has to be recorded and has to be shown to the buyer or whoever else that that transaction happened. And it's going to happen immediately, okay? We expect immediate response on the internet, right? And without this B tree, right, it would not have happened. And my point there is that people actually went out and tried to solve this problem. Right? The other one is the inverted index, which was designed for information retrieval. And the early use was actually in mainframe databases. The most most famous one being Adabas in the 70s. But it was not until uh, the search engines on the internet came along that the inverted index started being used uh, uh, more forcefully. And, the, and Google real-time indexing was actually in the early 2000s. And again, they modified or build stuff around the inverted index to support real-time indexing, okay? And nowadays you go on Google and you expect it to have the latest information all the time. 
learning algorithms invented by academics, researchers, for experimental research in the, between the 50s and 90s. All right? And you know, even deep learning, whatever, if you, you know, look at the work and, they will, and the uh, people behind it will admit to you that these are old algorithms. What changed was that uh, com compute, cheap compute became available as well as massive amounts of data. But the actual algorithms themselves are not new. They've iterated upon them since, but not much. Okay. So they were not designed for real world use. They're not dynamic. They're not interactive, so you have no control over it. Okay. And they do not scale in production. Okay. They may scale offline when you're doing you know, ETL, extract, extracting or transforming and loading, you know, whether using Hadoop or Spark or whatever, right? But they do not scale when they're in production. So this is the uh, traditional, uh, the conventional machine learning pipeline. Okay? At the far end, you've got data. You do feature engineering, which you can do either manually or with deep learning. You then pass those uh, feature vectors into your machine learning algorithm, and you train, test, and deploy. All right? And you get your model, and then you make predictions based for unseen data. But in the real world, you will always get new data. Okay? When that happens, you know, it depends on the application. For someone like Netflix, which I use, I typically see that they re seem to retrain the entire system every two to three days. So you've got new data. You're still doing feature engineering. Okay? But you are now retraining, retesting, and redeploying. Okay? And you get your static model with your predictions. Okay? And like I said, you know, when you retrain, retest, redeploy, it just depends on the application itself. So what's dynamic machine, what's dynamic machine learning? Well, what happens if you just take away this offline component and all the retraining, retesting, and redeploying? and also get rid of the static model. And that's all we have. All we have is this production. Okay? So you've got your data, you've got your feature engineering, your feature vectors go straight into the machine learning algorithm, and then you make predictions based on your unseen data. All right? Just to go back, I forgot to mention something here. In this model, Right, your machine, you got your feature vectors and your machine learning algorithm works on the feature vectors okay, to create your static model. Okay? Once you've got your static model, you are deployed, but your feature vectors are left home. They're offline. You don't do anything more with them. Yeah? In our world, you've got your features and the machine learning works on the feature vectors dynamically in real time. All right, let's move on to uh, the thingy solution. Okay. So thingy is a dynamic recommendation engine. It has three components. The first one is automatic generalization. Okay. So it makes inferences in real time. Okay. You can call it real-time learning. Um, is another word for automatic generalization. Okay. The other component is it's interactive, which means that it's driven by queries into the engine okay. through an API. And you can have, and right now we've got uh, one, two, three, four different uh, query APIs. And on the other side is dynamic, right, where you can add feature vectors, update them, update an existing feature vector delete them, and also just read them, okay? You can do this live, okay? live system. So what's going on? Very simply, 
we have a universe of things, and those things could actually be any data type you want. Okay? There are no restrictions on the data types. So there's images, videos, documents. You can even uh, combine them if you want as feature vectors. You have your query, and your query contains uh, components, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Right? And you get results back, right? and the results are ranked by how well each thing fits into the universe of things. Okay. So let's look at one. Let's look at uh, query. All right, I know that I'm tr uh, it's primarily about recommendation engines, but I've used images uh, because it's just visually better to... Really? Wow, I've only got five minutes left. Uh, what? Is, what? Okay. Wow, that was quick. I just got started. Uh, all right, so I've used uh, a WikiArt um, data set. The feature vectors were uh, obtained through deep learning. Okay. And what we have at the top is the query image and then the results. Okay, nothing special here. You can see this in other systems today, yes? Okay, so you can imagine this like being available in a museum where it's recommending uh, uh, paintings, yeah? Now, I can add a second image or painting to the query, okay? And it will immediately go away and give me results that are similar to both of the query images. Yep. See that? Nod. I can add a third image to the query. Okay. And you can see how the results change. Yeah. And the results are also, remember, it's, it's almost like mashing all three of those uh, query images and then finding stuff that's similar to that. I can add a fourth one. Okay. And I love how in the bottom row, the middle one, how that one turns out there. Yeah. Okay, add and remove. Okay. Actually, let me just stop. Let me just say something here. Okay. So, that query there at the top, right, with four, okay, there's two ways of looking at this, right? Standard that, okay, you know, I'm, I've got this machine learning recommendation, recommendation engine and I can put a query that consists of multiple items there and we'll go and find similar stuff to all of them, yeah? That's the standard way. The, the other way to look at it is to say that those four represent personalization, okay? So it could represent you in some way. Okay? And then you can keep that on your system somewhere to say, yeah, this is Fred, this is Joan, whoever. Okay? And every time you use that <coughs> set of items which represent a person, it will get personalized recommendations. Okay. Same thing, we start with uh, one image. Add a second one, I add two more. I can take uh, two away, take as many as you want away, right? And notice the results change each time. Okay. The API uh, is a kind of, it's almost kind of standard uh, Python API. Nothing too clever going on. Uh, Right now we've got a query request type for query, query more, query positive, query negative. Um, you enter the request type, the number of results you want back, whether you want the scores or not, okay? And that makes up the payload. Okay, I definitely want to do this one. Oh, hold on, two more. Okay, the next one is a query with more like this and these, okay? so. I've got those query images at the top three. I get the result images. 
And then I say, right, give me more, like that second one on the top left, right? And I get these. Again, nothing clever. You can get this in other types of systems. But what if we said, give me, from the result images, give me two. Give me more like those two. And off it goes, and it does that. And if you notice, on the, um, the second one on the right, right, is two people, I think, on a bench there. Okay? And the first one, it's found another one with people on a bench. All right. Yeah, this was the one that I really wanted to show you. Okay, the next one is more like these, less like others. All right? So I've got two query images, and I've got the results set. Again, it's uh, paintings. All right? Now, what I'm going to do right, is mark up as positive the top line and the first three. All right? And mark as negative the other two. Okay? And I do a query on that, and it gives me these. Yeah. Now, if I reverse it, I say, give me more like the negatives and less like the positives. I get these. All right. And so it's like a yin and yang. All right. Yeah, does it make sense? Yeah. So in a way, it's kind of saying, you know, give me the positive stuff, but, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, the dark stuff in there. Or give me all the dark stuff, but leave a little light stuff in there, okay? And again, it's all done through the API. Now, a big one is actually, uh, I said, on the dynamic part, is actually adding data, right, or whether you're updating it, okay? But I really don't think I'm going to, how much time have we got? Mm, yeah, okay, guys. I tell you what, this is going to be on the slides, okay? Uh, because it's kind of, you know, I have to kind of explain it step by step, right? But this is really a key set of slides, right, about adding data in real time. Well, adding feature vectors in real time. Okay, and I said right at the beginning that, you know, uh, consumers don't have control right now when they use uh, recommendation engines, okay? But now they can, all right? And the way you do it is to provide the relevant uh, UIX controls, okay? So, you know, whether it's more or less, you can have engineered serendipity, okay? Uh, restart, you could actually just, you know, use the uh, APIs in uh, inventive ways and create your own, right? But one of the good things is that you're not leaving the consumers in the lurch. You're giving them, like an open road, different ways to go, including restart, go back to the beginning if you have to. <coughs> and our roadmap uh, is a recommendation engine for everything. Okay? Some people call this multimodal learning. I, you know, put uh, documents and uh, video and, you know, images and, you know, try and find the stuff. Um, so from the work that I've done uh, earlier this year, I know I've solved this problem, okay? And I just need to just test it out now. But I, you know, I know it will work. And it will work for literally anything, okay? You know, so you do a query and bang, if, you know, if you've got uh, mixed media, mixed uh, data types, it will find it. It will bring it back. And just quickly, vision. You can't have a presentation without a vision, right? It really is about giving people control of their AI, OK? If we don't do this, right, we're all going to be in a lot of trouble down the road. And I think we already are in a lot of trouble. Okay? I also hope that we're going to get a new generation of <coughs> dynamic AI services, OK? There is no reason why we can't have a new Netflix, okay, or, or even, uh, you know, new social media services, if you want, okay? It just needs uh, entrepreneurs to recognize what they can do. And I also hope that 
there's a greater focus in the future about on dynamic AI, okay? You know, just like with the B tree and the inverted index, you know, there's a need now, okay? You can't have static systems being joined with dynamic systems. It just doesn't make any sense. And that's my last slide. 